should also just uh, hit record if anyone has a problem. Um, I hope that's not an issue and um, the recording will be available. We'll send a follow up email with any interesting links and uh, the recording to the workshop. Um, okay, so we have Ontario, Saskatchewan, Alberta represented. That's fantastic. Uh, I'm going to end that poll and then I'm just going to ask you a second question about what's your role. So a lot of what we do at the Outdoor Learning Store is tailored towards um, teachers or other educators. But I'm wondering, are you a teacher or are you someone who educates in your community or are you just a parent, a family member? Just someone who loves nature and is interested to get out there or something else. Are you a guide or um, any kind of outdoor person? I'll just wait a couple more seconds while we have some people rolling in. OK, we've got nature lovers some teachers, something else nature related, almost half. OK, so we're looking at a pretty nice sort of diverse group of people. And uh, yeah, at any point, if you have something to add, something that um, builds on what we're saying or uh, that you want to challenge or, or get involved with, please type in the chat or unmute yourself uh, and come and say hi. OK, thank you so much um, for being with us today. I'm just going to start my presentation here. Okay, move all the boxes out of the way so I can see what's happening. Okay, so welcome to Outdoor Learning Tools uh, and Resources for Wilderness Lovers. Uh, so my name is Jade Harvey Burrell. Uh, I'm an environmental educator, a physical geographer, and I work uh, doing outreach and events um, for the Outdoor Learning Store. And we are a non-profit charitable organisation um, that uh, provides tools, resources, professional development for teachers and wilderness lovers and outdoor people. Uh, I live uh, in Revelstoke, BC in the interior, uh, and this is um, adjacent to the lake uh, just south of where I live in the Slocan Valley, um, teaching some uh, grade nines about uh, geological time and resources. Uh, I think it's more important to uh, talk about the indigenous um, heritage and culture of where I am. So I live uh, in Revelstoke, which is the land of the Mishkakas, the Chickadee in Tanaha, uh, or the land of the bull trout for the Snipes people. We've also, um, the Okanagan Silks and the Shishwemet people have spent a lot of time uh, in Revelstoke, uh, which is just down here in the sort of center middle bottom of this page. And traditional ecological knowledge uh, is finally starting to get some of the recognition that it deserves for um, being able to understand and have a complete connection to the natural world around us that is not different from science, but is integral to so much that's in science. So um, as a visitor on these lands um, and a settler, it's incredibly important for me to recognize that these lands belong to others and have done for thousands of years and that the knowledge uh, and power that's held within these natural environments uh, is something they shared with me. Uh, and I, I hope to give back uh, rather than just take. So I'm standing here alongside um, the Columbia River with a bunch of lilies. So really, when you're a wilderness lover, your tools and resources can be age dependent. But I think a lot of the time it's just being out there. Um, we are doing some sort of waking our senses up exercise. And I think whether you're with a, a group, a recreational group or students or your kids, um, doing a sensory wake up. So we are looking for signs of life. We are closing our eyes and smelling what we can smell. And we actually we do a tune in. So I rub our hands together and then we do our, our, our dear ears and we listen. And we listen for sounds in front of us and sounds behind us. And, you know, the river is obviously predominant there in front, but sometimes there's a mill behind there so they can hear that. Uh, and I think just when you're going out there, just setting 
uh, a moment to transition. So phones away. Be in that moment, connect to the nature around you does a huge amount uh, just to start you off on the right footing when you are heading out uh, into the environment. Um, here I am with some great twos, grade one twos. Um, part of what I do is run a program called Nature Through the Seasons. And um, this is, we go for four uh, visits throughout the school year through the four seasons. And I dress up as a different seasonal um, uh, sprite or fairy. I'm the winter witch in winter. And so that's why I'm dressed um, so hilariously. I'm in spring, so all my colors are coming out. I've got flowers in my hair. And this is our tree, uh, the one that they're leaning upon. And when we go out, we've identified this as our tree and we did it by group consensus. And then we go back to that same tree through the year. And you can do this with your family or your group once a week. And at this age, it's just like, OK, what's changed? Is it, you know, mossy? Is it wet? Is it dry? Um, has it kept all of its leaves? Um, and obviously we have coniferous around, but we've got a big, big birch, paper birch. Um, so there is going to be these sort of strong changes as you get older you can start doing some sort of science if you want um you know let's measure um the depth of the leaf pile around the base in fall does that change from year to year how much uh, surface area does the foliage cover and provide shade is there a difference between what's directly underneath that foliage and beyond so um picking a tree visiting it is a very simple way and you can do this whether it's your backyard or a schoolyard or like deep in the wilderness uh, there's some really amazing things that you can do uh, sometimes i go further afield so this is um at the base of begby glacier which is like an 18 kilometer hike it's pretty vertical it's pretty miserable some might say especially on the way down for your knees uh, and this was taking a group of um, 14 to 16 year olds out on their first mountaineering trip. And they actually summited uh, at the peak, which is actually out of shot here. But they were doing a pretty good pose here, looking at the, the final rock slab. And you actually in the back picture, I don't know if you can actually see my mouse, but in line with the snow, if you head right, there's this shelf here and you actually have to climb up and go all the way up. So there's some more intense wilderness adventures. And here, of course, we're starting to look at risk, liability, um, safety we camped up there and spent two nights camping to break up the journey but then of course you need enough food and enough water I think one of the biggest things is if you're going to embark on bigger adventures is to utilize all of the tools available online things like adventure smart where you can do trip plans and get kit lists um, to really understand and delve better into weather um, but when we're out here we're going to look a bit more about some of the things we did uh, to keep them busy when we were up there and they'd finished doing all their hard work and they'd eaten, but it's still light. Uh, and though they're physically tired, they're maybe not so mentally tired. And uh, we'll look at some tools and resources that I use with this group. Uh, I'm also an ACMG top rope climbing instructor, and this is on Rundle Rock in Banff National Park. Um, I've spent the best part of 15 years um, trying to develop my own skills and some of those are dealing with situations where you might feel scared or uh, at risk or hanging off of a rock face or things like that but you don't have to be hanging off of a rock face on a piece of rope uh, to be having a wild experience or a wild adventure you know um down here underneath in the center of the rocks just going in there climbing up you know to head height or below which is um basically the cutoff point for having a spinal injury um, there's all kinds of things you can do depending on who your group are to get that feeling of adventure and wilderness. And my suggestion is only to do any of this rope stuff with an extremely qualified person or with a bunch of um, yeah, people with, with experience. Um, but that it, yeah, being wild doesn't mean you have to be out there um, putting yourself in danger. You could just be scrambling around lower down. So converging evidence strongly suggests that experiences of nature boost academic learning, personal development and environmental stewardship. And I think if you're a wilderness lover, you want to steward the environment uh, for the next generation, as Indigenous people have been doing for generations as well. Um, but it's not just whether you're a teacher or if you're a recreation, it's not a gap from learning. It's a place of 
um, learning in itself and then boosting academic. Uh, so my feeling is that when you're out there, uh, you're building. And whether it's uh, following some sort of really sort of, you know, you're doing a biodiversity study or whether you're just going for a walk, um, there is never a time that you're in nature that is not beneficial to all age groups and demographics. And, um, you know, the world is, is not an equal, equal and equitable place, unfortunately. Um, and I live in a very rural place, but I grew up in an urban environment. And um, something like uh, one of these like silk tubs uh, that you can do an enormous amount of games with um, works just as well on a playground as it does in a field, as it does in a meadow at the base of a mountain. It's super lightweight. Um, sheds water and here we are actually playing in the snow and we were um, investigating the sub Nivean zone so the zone under the snow where animals go to hibernate and we were playing foxes and mice um, it requires teamwork it requires um, you know collaboration and then some competition and um, yes I highly recommend getting one of these because um, there is an infinite number of games uh, and concepts that you can introduce um out yes when you're out more space this is um the revelstoke uh, reservoir and we're actually doing um some water quality testing here you can just see my little blue bag full of stuff and we were searching for macro invertebrates um and then we were doing a lot of just swishing around in the mud which was also great as well um i think one of the greatest things um that, I mean, obviously nobody likes a pandemic, but that we have appreciated how much learning uh, can happen outside and how that place can be not just a place of beauty, uh, but a place of education and inspiration uh, for all. So yeah, my recommendation is, and we also, I should say, this is, I mean, you can't see right behind where I took the picture is with, with 25 meters from a car park. So again, you don't have to go that far to get a feeling of wilderness uh, and to, to get out there. It could be just around the corner. And uh, wilderness, again, might look different for some of us. If we're talking diversity, equity and inclusion, uh, this is what wilderness looked for, at, looked like at a um, professional development workshop. Um, uh, this is Karen Lyre. She is the um, disability specialist and uh, consultant for the city of Vancouver and an incredible educator and uh, consultant and she took us to the wilderness we're in a playground just behind the school and we were doing all kinds of outdoor uh, adventures with a gas fire so maybe you can't go for a four-hour hike uh, into the wilderness but maybe you you know bring a sense of that wilderness to you so a bit of specificity, I suppose, about tools and resources. Okay, so I work um, for the Outdoor Learning Store and we have a store that's full of stuff. And I think um, one of the biggest things is it's like overwhelming uh, sometimes to go out there uh, and think, what am I doing, what am I doing? And I think, um, yes, there are a lot of beautiful books and things to do. So if you're starting off with young, younger kids, um, I really like music as a, as a key thing, whether it's music at home. So someone like Remy Rodin, who's an Enviro songster, who has these amazing songs like What's That Habitat? They have actions, talks about plastic pollution in a way that's not stressful, talks about uh, biodiversity. Um, you know, having this kind of music either in your car or your classroom or your house or in your guide group uh, and then going out and maybe making music using found objects, um, singing or walking along to the beat and getting that beat to change. Um, there's, you know, music is connective to the soul and so is being in the environment. And it just really works with younger kids to, to engage them. If you can make up a song and they can choose the last rhyming word or things like that. Um, books like the Big Book of Nature Activities um, have seasonal and area specific type um, sort of investigative um, ideas for going out there. And I think that's one of the biggest things uh, like natural curiosity is um, using indigenous perspectives in environmental inquiry. So you pose a question and then you let them go out. And 
I think this can be incredibly valuable for any age group and any landscape that you're in um, to ask, you know, uh, what do you think are the key types of plants that are here and how do they know? Well, they see them. And then how are you going to count them though? How are you going to get a representation across this whole area and getting them to think about finding a four sticks the length of their arm and putting them in a perfect square and then measuring what's in there and how are we going to ID them? And again, then you can bring in technology, you can bring in um, iNaturalist or apps like that, things that can absolutely sort of connect them to the technological world because you know that's a thing or take photos and then go back and id them using field books or bring field books with you um indigenous perspectives okay we um have this amazing bunch of books um bundle of books i should say from strong nations they're an indigenous uh, owned and produced uh, publishing house and there are some incredibly beautiful um allegory related to every kind of landscape and every kind of indigenous group uh, or first nations group in Canada and sometimes uh, starting your walk or your hike or your wilderness adventure with a story utilizing the language uh, the indigenous languages uh, of which now you can use something like first voices which has amazing uh, audio files and written um, records of, of keywords to do with the environment. So I think that can be a really incredibly powerful tool for connecting and, and kids any age, you know, we know they learn languages. Uh, a book like Silo in the Land, again, this was written by three young women um, from three different First Nations and illustrated by a female First Nations illustrator, um, talks about walking through a landscape and not picking all the flowers and thinking about what that water might mean to someone more than yourself. And there's just some ways that we can introduce recreation, responsible recreation or sustainability into the way we use wilderness with, with young kids. And if you're really looking to take a sort of learning teaching, something like dirty teaching, which uh, or the work walking curriculum by Gillian Judson. These are just like bite-sized paragraphs of um, let's look for patterns or let's look for shapes. And you can take those and create a whole day's worth of, of adventures out of them. And then maybe you want to go home and, and the school garden curriculum sounds like just building a garden at school, but it's not. It's about the way we think about food production and climate and connectivity between different elements of our ecosystems. And it's an amazing thing to take home uh, and start to work through if you're looking for family projects or part of recreational groups. One of the things that really works, or I have found really works when you're out, is to give kids something to do and hold or have, whether that's dip nets or little magnifiers, um, got magnifiers on a, on a lanyard that they can look at closely, um, binoculars, sit pads, uh, you know, a big thing in the environmental education world is a sit spot. So you go and you do a minute for your age. I mean, if you're 40, you, you still just do five minutes. I think there's a cap. Um, but you just sit down and, and I often like to give a, a random question. So if we're sitting and it's it's fall particularly, I say, OK, I wonder what it would like to be a tree and lose all your leaves. And the kids sit there for a minute and, you know, set a timer and and let them go in. Or maybe you ask them to think of three words or three sounds that they hear while they're sitting. Again, this can work any age group, adults just a moment to tune in, switch off, focus. It's meditation in its simplest form and it is an amazing way to connect. Give them a clipboard and a scavenger hunt uh, and, and, and watch how focused that, that energy becomes. And then things like a field guide that's very simple and something like the ones we have that are laminated and, and waterproof um, and, and go on a hunt, see what you can find. And the reality is the quieter you are, the more you're gonna find. So you can have some of the loud games, you can do some intro stuff and then you can really sort of draw down uh, and, and, and find some quiet time out in the wilderness. Um, this- Three, two, one, action. Oh. 
Okay, I'm not sure how great the audio was on that. And that is a bunch of my grade six, seven students who were very nervous about uh, being interviewed. But I asked them what nature meant to them. And uh, I don't know if you heard, but there was a lot of calm, um, adventurous, cool. Um, yeah, they that was something that made them happy. This girl at the end here has um, found a pet slug. And this was some food that she was going to feed it to. And this was her favorite stick that she found. And there was just a lot. Of course, we talk about responsible harvesting um, and making sure the slug went back. They're a pretty prolific species. Um, but these students, yeah, any whether it's family or anyone asking them, what is what is what was something that was great about today or what was something that you would change? Uh, when I'm out with any group, um, there's always some kind of debrief. There's always an introduction. There's always a conversation before. And then there's a debrief where we take a second to actually let sink in what's happened. And I think that can be the difference between um, just being outside and really connecting uh, while you're outside. And then getting them to film or do something like this. There's a lot of kids today that are very uncomfortable um, public speaking. I think all kids are, but um, they spend a lot of time texting and not a lot of time making eye contact. So this was really important for me. I try and do this as much as possible uh, to show them that I'm cool and that I know how to use an iPhone. Uh, and also that, um, you know, they can speak, they can share their perspective as early on as possible so that they get used to having a voice. Three, oh, two. It was a bit loud at that time. Okay, so as we get older, um, there's some thoughts and um, we can go into really delving into maybe the science or what's going on. So if you're interested in uh, teaching kids about climate change or teens about climate change and getting them to do some take action uh, and that could be projects that can be research um, the books um, by green teacher down the bottom left there are pretty amazing um teaching about invasive species so you know a lot of kids don't know that if you have a non-native bee species that it will not work with the pollinator plants uh, that are native or invasive species don't allow that pollination and, and one in every three bites of food comes from pollinated <clears throat> plants so these things like start to, to filter in and it becomes really important to them um, to build their own uh, sustainable way of living um, talking about place-based education where are you where are you going for your hike um, who lived there before? What are the key plants and animal flora and flora species? What's special about where you are? Can they find something to show you um, that they connect with where they are in this moment? And then talking of connection, um, Learning for a Sustainable Future have this book, Connecting the Dots, that really talks about how you can move forward and take real action with young people um, and transform their learning from here, sit at this desk and read this bit of paper and memorize and regurgitate it in an exam to here's a student who's gonna ask you questions about what you've just taught. And it's gonna start to formulate critical thought way before you know, we've been putting that into curriculum. Um, we have The Heart of the River and a People's Curriculum for the Earth. Heart of the River is a book about the Columbia River, but it's relevant to anyone about the way that we change a landscape as humans. And a People's Curriculum the Earth is a sort of collection of stories and journal articles and, and, and poems that really connect us to the world we're in and, and shifting our gaze. So whether you're actually teaching it or you're just connecting to it, um, that can be a really powerful tool. And then again, all ages, um, connecting with Indigenous knowledge. Groundswell is an incredibly moving book, uh, something you could read as a family, a page before bed or with dinner or, um, yeah, finding a way to really uh, connect what the world we're living in and, and, and connecting to climate change, particularly uh, with a call to action. So that's amazing. And Gillian Judson, again, who's this amazing uh, education professor, uh, has written many books, um, but if you're starting to look at how we absorb information, um, it's all about uh, imagination. That's what, what 
what sticks, right? That's what that makes people remember things for the future, whether you're talking about the environment or mass. And so when we educate from an ecological perspective with, with an imaginative frame, we can just change the next generation um, and the way that they think for the future and for ourselves. Reading that book has changed the way that I view myself. If you want to get really into it, um, one of the things I'm doing with groups is night uh, snowshoes or cross country skis or going for a walk at night with head torches and then turning them off and looking at like a star night chart. Uh, there are some amazing free um, apps as well. I can share one with you, Stellarium, where you can look at from your perspective exactly where you are at what's in the sky. There's indigenous um, or like ancient Greek um, gosh I've lost the word um where we have constellations constellations oh, thank, thank you Vanessa I could see you like mouthing it and it's coming out it's great so um all the different names for these constellations based through history and it's really just a fantastic tool for connecting physics the universe um writing drawing you can start to map things out uh, dressing properly for the night time having a fire those things can be really powerful and also something I'm doing with older students is like using proper water quality testing kits, whether it's a creek or a pond or uh, your drinking water. What's going on with it? What does it mean? And something like this kit for water rangers that like, has all the information, like you don't have to be a scientist to be able to interpret what you're seeing. And um, I do it with grade nine students uh, in a program called Know Your Watershed. And it is unbelievable the change in the way that they view uh, the environment around them. Ah, here they are. Uh, this was us uh, last spring and this was a pool. And what was interesting is as we got here, um, some people from the local council were coming to look um, at the culvert, which is just off out of shot on the right here. Um, basically, they had dug this pond out to better allow uh, a shallow area for fish to spawn. But what they did was take all of the vegetation off the bank uh, so there's no shade, so the fish are hiding way further back in the picture, and they did not angle the slope of the pond uh, steeply enough. And so what's happening is all this fine sediment is filling up the culvert, and they now have to dredge the culvert twice a year. So it was a really amazing way to teach students about when we alter a landscape, we often don't do a very good job. Um, so when you're out, maybe you're walking around in an urban environment, what's natural here? What has been altered? Or maybe you're out in the wilderness looking or you know, further afield, looking for evidence of impacts. Um, these can really connect people as you go. Uh, never underestimate the power of hot chocolate on a beach. Um, the kids made the hot chocolate on the stove. Um, marshmallows must be had, otherwise angry faces will happen the one time that I forgot the marshmallows. Um, I also make, um, I lived in Arctic Norway for a bit, um, only a short bit because it's very dark there a lot. Um, and we had, uh, they make snurbrö or snow bread. It's basically just a very simple bread dough. You can make it the day before take it in a thing and they roll a sausage and roll it around a stick and cook it over the fire. A jar of Nutella or peanut butter, maybe not with students, no peanuts, um, or whatever. And it's the most, or jam is the most delicious thing you've ever done. Uh, having something to sit their bums on definitely keeps them happier. Um, head torches if it's going to get a bit dark so that they all feel in charge of their adventure. Um, but yeah. Take them, take them on the adventure. I let them light the fire most of the time. Um, if you can't have a big open fire, uh, most places you would be able to use one of these. So this is just like one of those um, foil um, pie tins and we do a five minute fire. Uh, and you can do this with, you can buy um, like a flint uh, or you can do it with matches. Uh, and, you know, we did this in the middle of the day, but it was uh, an opportunity for them to test how efficiently they could do it and work as a team. Uh, so I suggest incorporating fire. Uh, we are here at uh, on the banks of the river doing rock sorting. So you can do this in a classroom as well or indoors if you needed to, where you go and collect rocks and then bring them in. But I got these guys to go and find four sticks um, 
that were the same length make a square and then whatever their square was they had to sort the rocks and we do it in stages so I said okay sort the rocks and they sort of look at you and I said okay so how could you sort it and you get size you get color uh, shape maybe and then I asked them to do it four rounds they've got like two minutes to sort all the rocks and then we start to look at texture we start to look at that you know and then we start well why is it a different texture? Why are some of them smooth? Why are some of them rougher? And then you can start to talk about landscape evolution or geology. And uh, there's just so many things and you get them thinking. And I've done this with kindergartens. I've done it with grade 12s. Um, obviously you ask them to go into greater detail. I ask them to name the groups that they've classified into for, you know, extra small, small, medium. It's amazing how excellent kids are at being scientists because they haven't been uh, sort of confined by uh, the education system yet. They are full of ideas about how to do things. Uh, from the same spot, we did uh, build an ecosystem. So we only took a very small percentage. Uh, this moss is quite ubiquitous where we are. And they collected sand, uh, soil, moss uh, in three different groups. And then we built them. Uh, I also uh, am naughty, but I go to thrift stores and find um, little plastic animals. And so they became like team. I've got a tiger in the one on the right. We had a giraffe. Uh, and then we asked, you know, is this the natural habitat of a giraffe to live in a mossy uh, pot? And they said, no. And I said, why? And then we can start a whole nother conversation about that. Uh, the little lid, just any kind of um, plastic container lid with water provides everything you need. And if you put it on a Sunday win sunny window ledge, these jars uh, can last for years. Uh, and then you start to see all the sort of um, soil dwellers, um, the decomposers come out and there's just an, any number of amazing uh, follow on projects that you can do with this. Um, those kids I took up to the top of the mountain. Um, get them sketching. Journaling is the most amazing way uh, to, to focus the mind. Uh, and these kids were like, oh, boring. And I just brought some plain paper and pencils. And I said, well, you know, sketch, you can sketch the natural, you can sketch the landscape, the, the skyline, uh, you could write words about what's happening here I was like but this is a moment in time and you will the feelings you've got about this amazing adventure on will wane they will dissipate and I'd love for you to to have something to uh, commemorate this uh, you can only just see this is actually me so I'm drawing the landscape we were quite high up it doesn't look as dramatic as it feels uh, this is one of the students um drawings which was infinitely better than mine um but you know he was like oh well I don't really draw and I said oh well do you think you did a good job there and he was like yeah and I was like I think you did an excellent job you know so all of these things just further connecting to them to the landscape oh I think that is it for me I um I could go on for many 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 hours um does anyone have any questions or ideas or things that they feel um, they would like to ask? Okay, well, if anything crops up, you can um, write it in the chat. But yes, all of the books and things uh, that offer the kind of uh, activities and ideas for investigations, um, are available in the Outdoor Learning Store. I'll share the link uh, a little bit later and in the follow-up email. Uh, and I really uh, am grateful uh, for you listening. And if you are ever interested, share the names of the apps for this guy. Yes, uh, it's called Stellarium, but I will, um, I'll find it for you, um, the actual link. And yes, I'm very grateful if you ever are also are in need of uh, support for taking people outside as part of the Outdoor Learning Store. You know, we're connected to the Outdoor Council of Canada. CPAWS have got some excellent uh, expertise as well that Vanessa's going to share in a moment. Um, but we would love to support you in your journey. Uh, so please let us know. I'm going to hand over to Vanessa now. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I loved your images and pictures and stories. They were amazing and just made me reminisce of the times before COVID when I was doing a lot more programming. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, no, I loved it. So I'm going to quickly share my screen here. Um, and I guess introduce myself very quickly. So my name is Vanessa. As Jade mentioned, I work with Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society Southern Alberta. I've been a interpretive hiking guide, snowshoe guide, and environmental educator with them for the last five years. And it has been an amazing, amazing time for me. I've done lots of learning and I've experienced a lot of amazing people and programs and landscapes. And I am so, so, so grateful for my experiences there. Um, some of you may not be familiar with CPAWS because you may be out of province, um, but CPAWS Southern Alberta is one of the chapters of the nationwide, hold up, gotta minimize this, of our nationwide not-for-profit. And Southern Alberta chapter is in, the office is in Calgary. So before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that mm -hmm. Our office is on the ancestral lands of the Nitsitapi or the Blackfoot Confederacy, which includes the Gunna, Bikani, Siksika First Nations, and the Blackfeet people of Montana, who have made this land home for thousands of years. In 1877, Treaty 7 was signed by the members of the Nitsitapi, the Satina First Nation, the Iyarhe Nakoda, which includes Wesley Chiniki and Bearspaw First Nations, alongside the Government of Canada. The city of Calgary that I call home, also known as Mohinkus, is home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, all newcomers and settlers and myself. And I am proud to call this land home and send out gratitude for the caretakers of this land, the First Nations people who have been here longer than I have. Um, so CPAWS is a conservation organization that is mission is to protect half of the land and water in Canada. And we do this through environmental education, as well as through policy decisions and lobbying government. So that's a picture of me and my son on the corner of McLeod Street in or Memorial Drive in Calgary, doing a COVID protest um, against the delisting of Alabama. Alberta parks in our province. And thankfully, due to the efforts of many citizens, CPAWS and our partners, we were able to change the province's mind on changing the listings of these protected areas. And I was very happy that my family was able to be a part of it. But CPAWS doesn't just do that in Alberta, we also do it across the country. Since 1967, though, in southern Alberta, we've led protection efforts in Banff National Park, Kananaskis Park, the Whaleback, the Castle Provincial Park. And we've been successful in many of our conservation efforts, partially because of our many dedicated staff, but also because of our supporters, some of which have been supporters since they were in elementary school and junior high school and high school because they have participated in our environmental education programs, which are, I am proud to say, award-winning. And they are award-winning because of the amazing activities and games and supplies that we use to connect people to nature. So CEPA Southern Alberta's environmental programs have been going on since 1997. And we have formally engaged over 150,000 Albertans in our programs. And what sets CPAWS programs apart is that we teach curriculum mostly through the lens of conservation. Our goal with every program is to inspire a connection to nature, a love of the outdoors, and a new generation of environmental stewards. And we achieve this by customizing our programs to fit the needs of the wide audiences that we provide programs too. So initially in 1997, back in the day, you can see these pictures are super old. They're from film back in the day when film was how we used to do things. Um, back then we only focused on, you know, delivering programs to school students, but nowadays we actually have expanded our programs and we um, take people out onto the landscape and teach them about nature and conservation. We teach new Canadians, English, English language learners, adults, and even corporate groups. And we use a lot of different supplies. 
So you can see in the picture here on the left, this image was taken at the um, Nazca Deus area in the Bow Valley, which is just on the other side of the Rocky Mountains from BC. It's just outside of Canmore, if you guys know where Canmore, Alberta is. Um, and these kids are doing a water testing kit. They're in grade nine, I think. And they're using what's called the hack water testing kit where we take these kids outside onto the landscape. They do some water testing at a local wetland. And then we actually take them for a quick jaunt over to another wetland where they do a second round of water testing. And then we compare and contrast the two results. And we ask them, you know, why would these two wetlands be different? Why are we getting different results? What's the landscape telling us about maybe why these results are different. But we don't want to create barriers for those who cannot, you know, afford a bus all the way out to Kananaskis or all the way out of the city. And so we also like to bring this learning into the classroom. So the picture on the left is also a grade, uh, maybe a grade five class, and they're playing with a watershed model where we teach them how you know, the activities that they do in their city, that the things that they do outside on the street, how those directly impact the quality of water in their local watershed, in the local river, and how the water quality in our rivers and our streams is really important, not just for us and us who use it and drink that water, but for the animals who live in that water and who use it all the time as well. Um, so we have lots of different programs that we offer. Originally, our bread and butter is classroom programs and interpretive hikes and snowshoes. However, due to the global pandemic, we've been able to expand our programs, which is really exciting. And we do more community walks. Um, so people don't have to take buses, they can stay in their cohorts and we can take them around the urban environment and teach them about nature in their own backyard. Or if they don't want to go for a too long of a walk, we can always just come into their schoolyard and see the nature that they are surrounded by all the time, but maybe they don't notice. And we deal with a lot of urban classrooms and a lot of schools that, you know, they don't live near a provincial park or they, they're very, very central. And we help to open their eyes through activities and games and resources as that nature is everywhere and they can find nature wherever they want. But um, if we can't go in person at all, we also do lots of virtual programs, which is super fun as well. And we have a lot of programs that we can offer. We teach everything from species at risk. We bring the stories of the animals and plants that are unfortunately at risk right now. We bring their stories to life through various games and activities. We teach trees and forests. We bring students out onto the landscape and teach them about one of the largest uh, ecosystems in Southern Alberta, which is the grasslands. And we go from climate change all the way to water. Mm. But with COVID flexibility, we also want to be able to provide the equipment that we have to all types of people. So we have loanable kits that can teach your kids about you know, electricity, waste, and water. And one of my favorites, this is my favorite subject right now, which is citizen science. I love to combine a student's, most, of, most students' love of technology with nature. And I find that citizen science is a great way to connect these two things because you can utilize very citizen science applications such as iNaturalist, Seek by iNaturalist, eBird. Um, if you're in Alberta, there's a great one called Nature Links. If you live in Calgary, there's a great one the city of Calgary has called Calgary Captured. And citizen science, if you're unfamiliar, is everyday people like you and me citizens helping scientists around the world solve real world problems. For instance, if you do eBird, you can go out, so you can download the eBird app onto your phone or create an account on your computer, and you can go and identify the birds in your local neighborhood, whether it be a magpie, a crow, or a bald eagle. You log that information onto the app or into your computer, and then you submit it. 
And that information goes to scientists around the world to help birds um, because unfortunately they're at risk due to a lot of impacts from climate change, from habitat destruction, et cetera. It's a very easy, tangible activity that anyone can do um, and it creates a sense of community. And it also um, brings science and makes science a lot more accessible, I think, to people that may not have thought that science was accessible to them before. So I teach about birds through eBird and I come into classrooms in Alberta. We teach it in grade three. We teach about life cycles with birds. And I also teach it in grade six through trees and forests. I talk about how birds are really an important part of the forest ecosystem. And we go out and explore and I teach them how to identify birds with binoculars. Um, we use bird ID guides. We use this amazing app called Merlin um, Bird ID, which is a quick five step questionnaire about the bird you're seeing. You enter all the information with this bird that you see and it'll give you uh, a variety of options of birds that it could that it could be based on where you are, which is very, very helpful for younger students that are maybe not as doesn't don't have as high literacy. So they can just like do those quick questions and then they'll be able to say, oh, it's a pileated woodpecker, something that they probably wouldn't have been able to figure out with a bird ID guide out in the field. So we teach through birds. We also teach about pollinators and we use Seek by iNaturalist. Seek is an app that you can download onto a tablet or smartphone. And it has a feature where you can scan items. So you can scan a flower, you can scan a bee or an animal, and it will give you through photo recognition technology, a, a guess. It's usually a pretty good guess. Sometimes they're kind of off a guess as to what type of, what species it is. So if I scanned a dandelion, it could say a dandelion. If I scanned an ant, it might tell me it's a wood ant. So I take these, so I take kids out and we use Seek and we are able to identify different animals in their area and talk about what that means for the biodiversity that's around them, which is super great. And we use these, both of these apps as well when we talk about urban wildlife with older kids and talking about biodiversity and it's super great fun. If you take anything from my talk right now is that citizen science is amazing and I will link to the various citizen science websites and platforms that we use at CPAWS right now um, in the chat after my presentation. Um, yes, that's my big passion right now is CPAWS is the program I just built for citizen science. But in all our programs, we have so many fun activities. So we do snowshoeing or winter programs. This is an image of a couple of kids playing the predator prey game, which is super easy. It's a basic tag game with images and bandanas. If you want to use them, bandanas is probably one of my favorite random pieces of equipment that I use on our outdoor programs. Um, but a lot of the time, actually, we use, especially as a guide, I don't love to bring a ton of stuff with me if I'm going out on a hike or a snowshoe. So using the natural environment around me as a teaching tool or as a piece of equipment is my favorite way. I mean, obviously, when they're younger, you're like, please don't throw sticks. Please don't throw rocks at each other. Let's just be nice and safe. Uh, but this image right here is uh, a tipping point game. It's a climate change game where all the kids are getting a stick and the stick has to be, it can be different sizes or you can ask them all to find one the size of their forearm or their hand. And they hold the stick and then they have to switch. So slowly but surely they'll reach over to the person on their right, put their finger on their stick and then switch over. But as each round goes, they have to start taking steps backwards with their sticks. And maybe people, if they let their stick fall down, that means that that ecosystem in their circle, that that ecosystem has collapsed, unfortunately. And it's talking about how due to climate change and the changes in our ecosystems, some ecosystems are collapsing. And then you can talk about what that means, just like the animals that live there, what that means to us and ways that we could, and then you brainstorm ways that we could potentially, you know, help resolve some of these impacts of climate change that we're experiencing today and could experience tomorrow. Um, this is a great, we do lots of in-class waste sorting, taking 
kids, um, not to taking kids into a classroom and just sorting out some waste and brainstorming ways that they can reduce the waste and talking about you know the impacts both locally and globally on consu that consumer culture has that they probably haven't thought about. And oh, that's a really fun activity. It's called Rock, Paper, Scissors, Fraud, a teacher's life cycles, where the kids start out as an egg and then they go around and they play rock, paper, scissors. And if they win, they get to go to like their next life stage, which is um, a tadpole. And then they go to a froglet and then they become a frog. But some of them never make it within the time frame of the game. And you can talk about, hey, why would maybe some of these frogs um, not be able to transform, metamorphosize from the egg to the frog. And that's a really fun activity that gets kids moving around, especially if you've had them sitting for a ton of time. Doesn't take a ton of uh, prep. Everyone knows how to play rock, paper, scissors. Doesn't take a ton of room and um, doesn't take a ton of supplies. So that's a fun go-to one for me for teaching younger kids about life cycles. Um, and we also love to, you love to use biofac. So this is a, our grasslands program and we have a real bison scat, which is really funny. We have some bison fur and a horn and, that we use to teach kids about the grasslands and the bison. And we also love to incorporate indigenous knowledge and stories that we've um, been gifted from elders or that we've read in various publications, many of which were mentioned by Jade and are sold at the Outdoor Learning Store. Um, really amazing resources at the Outdoor Learning Store that CPAWS uses all the time in our programs, um, whether it's activities, games, supplies, or Indigenous stories. Um, and some of the games, yeah, like this little boy on the bottom, he's playing camouflage in the grass. I'm sure a lot of a lot of you are familiar if you're a teacher with camouflage and we always teach it through um, talking about habitat loss. We have a boundary for camouflage and every round the boundary gets smaller and it's harder and harder for these animals to survive and to camouflage in the, in the landscape that they're given. And then we brainstorm, well, why are you losing your habitat? Is it human caused? And how could we, you know, increase the habitat for these animals? Could we create parks? Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society is definitely all for the creation of parks and wilderness spaces and protecting those areas for these animals that do desperately need them. Mm -hmm. And with that in mind, we currently at CPAWS are doing what's called our biodiversity initiative. So we're proud to be a voice for wilderness in Canada. And we also recognize that historically wilderness and you know, the field of conservation has not been very inclusive and welcoming to all Canadians and Albertans specifically talking about where I live. And because of this, we're aiming to reduce the barriers to black and indigenous and people of color or BIPOC audiences um, in nature and in our field. So currently we are working on these six initiatives or these are our kind of six promises right now through our biodiversity initiative to help bring more diverse faces and voices and experiences to the natural world because nature is for everyone. I firmly believe that. And through our programs and our activities, we're hoping to make CPAWS and our programs and activities more inclusive and welcoming to all audiences and histories as well. Because sometimes through the work that we're doing right now, I have never actually realized sometimes how exclusive um, and not welcoming some of our activities and language and approach can be to people who are not from Canada, to people who um, you know, maybe don't identify as a gender, they are non-binary, or someone who um, parks are a place that their people were historically excluded from. Um, and through the work that CPAWS is doing in our programs in the Biodiversity Initiative, I'm able to better understand how I can make programming activities more inclusive to these people. I hope I was I hope that was um, concise. I apologize if it didn't make a lot of sense. I went off script there. 
and it's it's dinner time so sometimes I go a little wonky um, if you're interested in learning more about some of the activities and supplies and kind of games that we use we have some free lesson plans on our website under the bring nature home tab and I'll put a link to it in the chat after this but we have everything from sound maps to gardening to uh, scavenger hunts and winter activities on our Bring Nature homepage. Mm -hmm. This is just a quick link if you wanted to screenshot it. And it's an also there's a link to our action challenge page, which has more examples of various activities, games, and things that CPAWS does in nature with students and kids. Uh, but I know we have two minutes left until the hour, so I will stop there and hand it back over to Jade and open it up to any questions, comments, or clarification that you guys have for me. Thanks so much, Vanessa. Um, it's amazing to see how many different um, options. Uh, yeah, amazing course, Andre says, um, and just how you've adapted uh, into giving people what they need <clears throat> despite the the challenges and I think that's been seen across the board um but how I mean I love what you're saying about citizen science um and you know you can connect with CPAWS maybe CPAWS isn't your local group maybe you have a local water stewardship group or another NGO and you can reach out to them maybe if you're a teacher you can take your kids for a very simple creek cleanup or a shoreline cleanup or a cleanup of the the fence around your schoolyard. Um, it gives kids a real sense of um, ownership over their own landscape and their own future. And um, I think there's so many things you can do um, with or without equipment. Um, I'm so grateful for everyone's time uh, and for joining us. I do have two $25 gift cards uh, to give away for the outdoor learning store. Uh, and I wondered if, you could give me two reasons. Um, I'm going to get you to type in the chat. The first two people um, to type um, two reasons why they came to this or what they were hoping to get out of it. So we can know whether we hit that uh, or whether we need to think about developing that more. Um, two reasons why you're here and uh, or what you were hoping to gain. And then I can uh, send off some gift cards to our first two participants. Learning new activities and discovering new partners. Great, Julie. Thank you so much. Um, I have your email. I will send you a gift card uh, for the Outdoor Learning Store. And Lauren says, first of all, learning what you guys in Canada are doing. Where are you? New Camp. That's Dutch, right? But are you in Holland? Um, we do ship worldwide, for sure. And Marie says, more ideas for outdoors in winter and discovering other resources. That's great. Uh, winter specifically, we didn't touch on um, too much, but um, yeah, it's the middle of the night. Well, congrats for staying up. Uh, I will send you an email. Rochelle says, I want to gain more confidence taking groups outdoors and I want to connect with others. Um, that's amazing, Rochelle. If you look at um, books uh, like Dirty Teaching uh, or uh, the Big Book of Nature Activities, they take you through the whole process. The other thing that you can do is join in on one of our other um, free outdoor learning workshops. Uh, I'll send you the link in the email, but we have experts from early learning specifically to teaching in winter, uh, and they're all available um, the recordings of ones we've already done are available on the website. It's outdoorlearningstore.com slash workshops. And we've got a few more coming. A little bit more inspiration on sharing the outside. Ideas to engage guests and interpretation ideas. Yeah, I think really just start close. Start small, take steps outside uh, and work your way out um, further and further. And yeah, there are an amazing amount of resources um, on our website as well. We have links to all of our different partners who, again, have links that are kind of specific to every ecosystem, to every connection to the environment that you could possibly think of. Uh, so have a little mosey around. We have a blog 
Uh, we also have a podcast, Earthy Chats. I'm going to put the link in the follow-up email where um, I basically interview with Ian, the editor of Green Teacher, a lot of the authors that have written these books and their inspirations and how they started. And you would be surprised how many of them were not uh, naturally natural people uh, and it came to them later. So we're all on that learning journey. Uh, please feel free. My email will be the personal email that I send you the follow up email. If you have any deeper questions or um, uh, desires I to, to learn more, I can share with you for sure. Um, thank you so much uh, for joining us this evening. And I'm very cognizant that we've all uh, probably zoomed out. Um, so I will say thank you and good night. Um, Julie and Andres, I'm going to send you a, a gift card and uh, I wish you farewell. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vanessa.